as we're beginning this new series titled Family 360. You know, all of us, we recognize one thing that is very dear to us is our families. You know, we care a lot about our families. We are here to make it big so that our families can have a better time. But it's just too common to notice, especially in the Bay Area, which is such a high-energy, high-tech place. It's the tech capital of the world, right? We, we, this is the place that invents things. This is the place that drives innovation. And this is also a place where the work pressures are very high. But as you look around, everyone who is here, they come here for one reason, which is to succeed. And typically over the years, people were drawn to the Bay Area, as I shared earlier, because long ago, this was one of the most fertile places in this country. So the soil was rich, so people came here so they can make it big in farming and agriculture. And then you had the 1849 gold rush, where California was the spot which drew people because of the phenomenal amount of wealth that they can make. And there were a few of them who hit the gold jackpot. And MGM, you know, the famous movie industry, it, that's one of the many things that came about because of the wealth that the gold rush generated. And fast forward a few more years, and now there is something else that is drawing people to this place and that's technology. You know, California has become the hot spot of innovation for technology. And especially now, this is a technology that's defining our whole world. Our, our world today is a digital world. You know, the world has shrunk to the size of your um, tablets and your cell phones and our computers. And who is inventing it? Who is driving it? It's people like you and me. But there is always a cost that is paid for the success. You know, I was very saddened to hear a few years ago when Toyota was making its uh, Prius breed of cars, that the first release of the car, as soon as it happened, the chief engineer who designed and architect who was behind this car manufacturing, he died. It was just so much pressure on him to deliver that that he had forgotten his family, forgotten to take care of his health, and at the end of it, what we saw happen was this guy just lost his life. So you see, as much as success brings innovation and new things into this world, there is always some cost that is being paid someplace, somewhere. It's either in our health, or as you can hear in the speeches of some of the famous CEOs or tech entrepreneurs who have been serial entrepreneurs, I've been so successful, uh, it just cost me two marriages. You know, and they'll say it proudly. Or others would be so success-oriented and focused and create extraordinary things, but don't have time to spend with their children, and at the end, their children turn their backs on them. So success at what cost is the question. And we need to ask ourselves, we are here in the Bay Area. All of us are very successful people, I'm sure. That's why we are here. But how are our family being impacted by our success? You know, that's the question we want to ask. You know, the famous classic of the Odyssey, I don't know how many of you have read the Odyssey, the central character Odysseus, he is constantly being pulled between coming home to be with his family, and along the way he finds all these interesting wars that capture his attention, and he gets engaged fighting these wars. He's a warrior, he loves to fight battles, but he also loves his family, loves his home, and wants to be with them. So he's being drawn between these two things and spends his whole life caught between that, and most of us today are modern-day Odysseuses. We are all, we want to spend time with our family at the end of the day, but there's just so much work to do, and at the end, we, are, we, we make some sacrifice that costs us somewhere. So, in order to understand, how can we, how can our families be healthy families? At the same time, how can we be successful in what we are doing without sacrificing any of these things we need to really get back to the basics here. You know, if you are designing a product, and if a product is functioning and malfunctioning, you want to go and talk to the one who designed it, because he has the tips to make it work. 
So that's what we were trying to do today is as we start this new series, we want to look at three things that our lives are involved in. Our lives revolve around our work, our lives revolve around our marriage, and our lives revolves around our children, our parenting. And unless we are able to integrate these three spheres in a harmonious way into our daily lives, our lives are not going to be happy. We are going to win somewhere and lose somewhere else. And for most people, if we ask, how do we deal with these three spheres? How do we deal with our work? How do we deal with our marriage? How do we deal with our parenting? For most of us, we are very fear-driven in our work. Oh, if I lose this job, I don't think my life is going to be great. I need to make this money. I need to be on this track. And, and if you look at our marriage, for most of us, our marriages are driven by one person trying to control the other person. And if you're married long enough, you know exactly what I am talking about. For those of you who have not experienced this, I need your autograph right after I'm done with this. You guys are great. <laughs> and then the way we deal with our parenting is we tend to idolize our children so much and start worshiping them that they become the center of our lives. Our whole lives try to revolve around them. So we've kind of messed up a few things here and there. A fear-driven work ethic, a controlling marriage, each one just trying to control the other person, and then an idolizing of children way beyond what they are capable of or needed or their real life purposes. So we end up tightly caught between these three things and we choke ourselves literally to death. So today I wanted to focus on the first part, work. I think we need to get this sorted out. Why do we work? What is work meant for? And how can we work in a way without letting that impact our families? And, or if you're young and you're students, why do you study what you study? And what do you want your education to help you to become whatever you desire and aspire to become? And how can all of these things happen without compromising your time with one another and happiness and joy that everyone is called to experience in our families? And therefore, we want to go back and look at the designer. Where did marriage begin? Where did work begin? Where did creation begin? We want to go and look at the first family that the Bible talks about who experienced all of these things and who actually seemed to have had it figured out pretty well. And there are some wonderful lessons that we can learn from. And, and when we talk about work, you know, we are not the first ones to invent work. We are working. It has been there for a long time. But for most of us who are adults here, we have worked for nearly half of our lives. You know, our whole lives were spent on acquiring an education so that we could get a work that pays enough money. And then we have found ourselves in a social status of a job that gives us some prestige and affirms our sense of self-worth. And we are on this trajectory to hit the next milestone of whatever it may be. You know, Bob Buford is a guy who came up with a fantastic book called Half Time. Now, you guys should read this. And this is what we ha he has to say. He says, how our first half of our life is so focused on success that we, once you reach that point and you actually become successful, you realize it's still empty. And you feel that you've been chasing the wrong thing, that after success... There isn't anything more that's so fulfilling. And so what he is postulating is halftime is a time between games where you pause. You know, you, teams evaluate the strategy. You look back and see what worked, you know, which, how was the defense, how was the offense. And you realign yourself, you reconfigure yourself so you have a winning shot possibility in the second half of your life. So that is where God has brought us, and we are, most of us find ourselves in as a soft time. And this is what we say is, for the second half of your life to be better than the first half, you must make the choice to step outside of the safety of living on autopilot. You must wrestle with who you are, why you believe what you profess to believe about your life, 
and what you do to provide meaning and structure to your daily activities and relationships. Sounds so hard. Sounds very difficult to most of us, isn't it? Because we're used to doing the same thing. But today I want to take our attention from a biblical perspective of what is work? Why, where, what is the philosophy of work? Why do we have to work? And what was God's original design in work? And that is what we had read to us. Uh, the first book of Bible talks about God creating us. And it opens very beautifully with showing who God is. You know, in the opening scenes of any movies, you have this entry of the main character. There is so much of pomp and glamour and music and all of that, especially if you're into watching Hollywood movies or Bollywood movies or, you know, South Indian movies. So you would expect when the Bible opens and talks about God, it's going to be thunder and lightning. But the way God is described in the Bible as God is working. You know, the Bible opens with a picture that shows God is deeply engaged in work in creating this entire world. He's creating the heavens, he's creating the earth, and here you find one person, you can listen to the scaffolding, who is creating millions of products that occupy all three domains of air, land, and sea, and unleashing it in one moment, and they all work together impeccably, perfectly, without any flaw or fault. Now, those of you who are product engineers and have been creating products, you know that any product that is launched, it always hits some crisis that people come back to, you got to fix it, right? But here is God, the perfect worker, in a sense. He's, he's designing him this entire world and launching it so beautifully. And the height of God's creation is man. It says at the end, God creates man in his own image. You ever wonder why do we all have this drive to work? Where does this come from? You cannot not work. Try to make yourself not do anything for a while. Maybe for us, we all think, I just want to take a vacation where I don't do anything. But if you do, after three days, you'll start becoming restless if you're really not doing anything. Because we are wired to do something productive, something useful, something creative, because that is the image of God. And God just doesn't create us in his image and leave us there. He says, I want you to carry on this creativity that I had so far, I'm going to impart to you that you can go and be this creative person in the world outside. So he wants us to study this world, he wants us to understand it, and he wants us to take complete control of all of these areas that he has done, and that's why we study. I mean, the whole purpose of gaining an education is to understand this complex ecology of world around us. And it's not just that. God wants us to be fruitful and multiply the things he has created. So the purpose of work is to look at all these things that are outside and find how we can multiply them, how we can make them fruitful, make them useful, and amplify. So inside this first couple, Adam and Eve, as the Bible calls, you know, they are packed within them a potential to create millions and millions of new products and, and new worlds. And th those gifts God has packed. And as we come from them, we all have this diversity of gifts. We have this diversity of talents that we can use to create beautiful things in this world. You know, George Bernard Shaw is, a very, is known for his witty one-liners that he writes, and this is what he says, there are two sources of unhappiness in life. One is not getting what you want, the other is getting it. Do you get it? Let me read it again. It says, one is not get, there are two sources of unhappiness in life, one is not getting what you want, and the other is getting it. You know, they did a survey, a Gallup survey in the U.S., and they found that two out of three people in the United States believe they are in the wrong job. 
there must be something to it. Why is that the case? And, and, and when we look at that, you see, oh, oh, all you say sounds so very beautiful, but my work li- right now, just like these two out of three people, it really is not that great. So we are looking at work, and what we are seeing right now in our day-to-day work is it's filled with pain. It's filled with uh, uh, greed and uh, people trying to you know, get the better of one another. But what we need to look at is, this was not how God designed work to be. And that's where we are. And so we need to, there was a beginning to this world, the work. And, and then there is also going to be an end where work is going to take on a different meaning. You see, when the world was created, it was created perfectly. And so when God gave, created the first human beings and unleashed them to go and create these new things, his perfection, his, his creativity was passed on to them, and they were able to go about it, but something happened. And that's what we are going to see. So what, 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 who has knowledge about all of these products of this world is God alone. You know, you can't use a product without having knowledge about it. So in a sense, God has this life-sustaining knowledge about this entire world, and he says, I'm going to give it to you guys, but it's only going to work as long as we have direct lines of communication and a relationship. So there in Genesis chapter 2, God brings all the animals... To the first human being he creates and he tells to Adam, name it. And what is happening right there is God is initiating science and technology right there. Your first taxonomy is happening there. And so they have the, the science and technology eventually have their beginning in God. So the knowledge that is inside God, he is passing on to this human being and letting him go and create these new things. And what the Bible says is, God sees all the things that he's created, and it says it was good. You know, all the products that are being produced, from this knowledge that God passes on, actually are good. You know why? Because they do something good. And that is why they are called goods. Goods are supposed to be good. We refer to things that God created as goods because... They really serve some good purpose, and that's what makes work very meaningful and attractive. This has been cut off. When God, who is here, and he creates work, he says, as long as we have these direct lines of communication, work is going to be beautiful. You're going to have fulfillment in life. Otherwise, you're going to change it. And something happened, as we all know, Our human beings, our greed took over, our self-centeredness took over, and we cut off this relationship with God. And as a result of that, most of us are really lost. We, We really don't know who we are anymore. We don't know how we are wired, what are our gifts, what are our talents. And even if we do, we have a fear of the present and fear of the future. You know, Pat Gelsinger, um, he's a CEO of VMware. I got to know him recently, and uh, he has written a fantastic book called Juggling Life's Demands Between um, Faith, Work, Marriage, and Kids. You know, as a CEO, you can understand how um, difficult his situation is and what are the extraordinary amount of pressures that he has and he says the first thing that he recommends why people are unable to be successful in integrating these is we are not living our life's purpose we don't really know what our purpose in life is so we go about crying from one thing to the other to the other to the other and, and, and because we are not Sure, we end up with a job that is really not a good fit for us. And we are doing it only because we think that's the only way to make money and living in this world. And there is no sense of God involved at all. So the first change that happened to him and many people is, 
we need to first recollect with God. You know, God didn't see as soon as, you know, human beings as people, we rebelled against Him. He just didn't let the world to be just as it is. He says, I'm going to come and reconnect and restore the relationship I have with you and me. And he did, and that is why he sent Jesus Christ, who comes, and he actually, since he was doing the work of God, he sacrificed his whole life to re reconnect us with God. And now, through him, we can actually have a renewed understanding of work. And, and when we have this understanding of work, um, we will be able to, first of all, find out what God made us for. So if there was someone who asked you, what is the one thing that your heart is so passionate about that you want to change before you leave this world? Or when you die, what is that one thing you want to be written on this epitaph? You know, here is buried so and so. They lived their entire life as this and did this. What would that be? Do you know that? right now? If we don't know that, then our lives are going to be spinning around a crazy circle. We're going to be trying a bunch of different things and not really hitting it. And the reason we don't know that, most of us, is because we have lost our connection with the original designer, the creator, God himself. Without God, you cannot discover that in your life. The moment we cut ourselves from God, the moment God is no longer important in our life, we don't understand who we are. And we don't understand what we need to do. But when we do find God in our lives, things change. And, and God actually comes and gives us a new heart. He, he dispels all the darkness. And, and this is what he, how He leads us. He, he leads us by putting us in situations that bring out our natural giftedness. You know, all you have to do is, once you reconnect with God, to see, where has God used me so far? What are all the things that I have enjoyed doing that have come naturally to me? You know, Frederick Buechner, he says uh, this, that the best place to be in our work is when our deepest passions and our best gifts combine to solve a real hunger or need in the world. Our deepest passions and our best skills combine to solve a real hunger or need in the world. That is the sweet spot when we find it, it's very liberating. Then we are not going to spend extra hours in office to impress our boss. You know, you don't have to spend uh, till 8 o'clock and 9 o'clock and come home and have no time with your family. Once you discover this, it, it's a very releasing thing. And, and God wants to help us to find that. So each of us can, can spend, make every minute of our life count. Vaclav Havel is a philosopher. He says, the real test of a man is not when he plays the role that he wants for himself but when he plays the role God has for him. So what is the role we are playing in our day-to-day -day lives? Do we know what our life's purpose is? Why are we here for? If not, that's an indication that we're not connected with the original designer, the creator God. And without his help, you cannot find it. But when you recognize this, then we, are, we can go and ask God to come and reveal himself. And why is it that we are not able to find it? You know why? Because by default, just like how the first person failed, there is a sense of selfishness in all of us. There is a sense of self-centeredness in all of us that twists the purpose of work. And, and that is what ends us to be where it is. But once we get this, it helps us to have a balanced view of life. It first gives you a tremendous amount of satisfaction. And secondly, it helps you to excel in what you do. You know, one of the verses in the Bible, it says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. 
You don't work for your God, you work, you work for your manager, you work for God. Once you recognize your purpose and once you recognize what you do. And then you'll be able to excel really well and it comes happily and joyfully and not without a grudge. And if you're not able to excel in what you're doing, then you're probably not really in the right job. But God's plan for this world is not this. He wants the world has a happy ending. He's going to create a new world, a new heaven and a new earth, he says, where you're not going to have all of these problems that we have. And where are all those engineers and where are all those products that are going to be found in this new heaven and new earth going to come from? It's going to come from right here as you and me are involved in, in, in rebuilding this world. We are going to take it with us. You know, Pat Gelsinger, in his book, uh, he talks about how he, once he's able to connect that, how he does this with his family. So he has a point system where he tends to say, if I come home before 5 p.m., then I get two points. Or if I come home before 6 p.m., I get one point. And if I come after 6 p.m., I get zero points. And then he and his wife, they tabulated. I mean, he's a geek, right? I mean, what, who, what kind of a guy would tabulate how much time? But really, he actually does that to really evaluate how much he's able to balance between his work and his family to spend time with his wife and kids. And he says he spends 10 hours a week with his family. Make sure he clocks that in. And... and if a CEO of a major tech company can leave at 5 o'clock, I think you and me can do that. <laughs> when you know that you're in the right place, doing the right job, solving a real problem, then you're not actually working for your box. You're just so passionate about this thing. You give all you got, and then you actually tell people, I do have a family, and I want to spend this time with my family. Because if you don't invest that time in, in, with your family at that point, you may develop great products. But then your family is going to take a big hit. And you will recognize that pretty soon. So why do I go from here? The first thing is to take a reality test. Hey, on a scale of 1 to 10, how much do I enjoy what I do right now? If you are at 10, perfect. This, you, you don't have to listen to the rest of what I have to say. But if it's less than 10, or if you're studying and you know some of you guys already know what subjects you like and all of that, that's really cool. You know, there are, you need to really sit and figure out what is my life's vision and mission? What do I want to accomplish with my life, with my family, with the skills that I have, you know, that naturally come to me and that I have actually used so far in my life with reasonable success and have solved some problems and could be small, you know, collecting those stories gives you an indication of the blueprint of your life. And, and then there are plenty of tools out there to evaluate what you're good at and how you can excel in all of those things and that's where you get started. So you see, Understanding God's design for work is a very freeing thing, but it is all at the center connected to this relationship with the designer. And the question for us today is, do you know this designer? And we tend to be people who want and are able to live our life by our own strengths. But that's not going to be possible. That's not going to really help us to live our lives in ways that will free us to enjoy. In the next couple of weeks, we're going to move on to talk about marriage. See, work is God's idea. It was not a human invention. You know, work was something it was deeply passionate in God's heart, and he did. And in the same way, marriage is God's idea too. And God, it didn't just come about as society evolved and people wanted to do something good. And he says, marriage in the same way uh, there is a model that God defines for us. What makes a happy family? What's the role of a husband? What's the role of a wife? And what's the role of children? Those are all beautifully outlined in this very same pages of Bible. And that is what we are going to look in the days, uh, in, in the following week as we move forward. But for today, I just wanted to leave us with this. Life is busy. You know, and our time can go very fast. But take a pause button. You know, go home, spend the afternoon reflecting about your life. Hey, how is my life going? Do I really know what my purpose in life really is? 
And then ask yourselves, do I know the designer God who created me? If I don't have a connection with him, I don't have a relationship with him, I will not be able to know that. And then if you don't, and if you see yourself being such a self-centered person, and if you've seen others being like that, you can ask God to draw you into a relationship with him. And he's willing to do that. And when we surrender ourselves and when He comes into our life, He can make meaning come back into our lives and help us to experience this joyful family. And I'm going to spend some time praying for us, for all of us here, that God would bless us and help us to get on this journey. And this is a journey you cannot discover sometimes on your own. And you need a group of friends. And that's why we have uh, some small groups that meet on Friday evenings at different places where friends can tell you, hey, I think you're really good at this. I think you're really passionate about this thing. And, and just come alongside and pray for you and encourage you and help you to move on in this journey. And, and especially as a, as a Spectrum Church, it's our passion to want to help every family succeed and thrive in being the best God wants you to be in your work, in your home, as a husband, as a wife, and in dealing with your children as well. Shall we pray?